Okay, good afternoon and welcome uh, to this uh, seminar on uh, com how contested stake states seek international recognition. Welcome both to our on-site uh, audience and our online audience uh, this afternoon. My name is uh, Helge Blokkesru and I'm an associate professor at the University of Oslo and a senior researcher here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Not all bids for secession result uh, in clear-cut success or failure. Um, some end up as uh, stalled, incomplete processes where secessionists have uh, secured control over a given territory and a population, but are denied international recognition. Such states in the making, stuck in the limbo between reintegration and uh, full-fledged independence are often referred to as contested states or de facto states. And a defining trait of such uh, de facto states or contested states uh, is that they are not recognized by other members of international society or other uh, internationally recognized states or only by a handful of, of, of such states. The question is then, how do uh, these contested states go about trying to, to break out of this isolation and win international recognition or engagement? Uh, we are lucky here uh, today to have one of the leading experts on uh, de facto states uh, uh, coming here to discuss um, this question, uh, Donnacal O'Bachwain. That, that's a tough one, but I, I, is it uh, accepted? Absolutely. Fine, great. Who is a professor uh, at the School of Law and Government at Dublin uh, City University. So uh, Donika will give uh, a presentation and uh, afterwards we will open up for uh, Q&A uh, and, and comments, both here from uh, the audience and for our online audience, feel free to, to send uh, question uh, to us as well, and we'll include them in the conversation. But without further ado, I'd give the floor to, to Donika. Please. Oh, thank you, Helge. And uh, I'm not used to wearing this little thing around my ear, but I'm sure I'll get used to it. It reminded me of a, a movie once, a comedy, Leslie Nielsen movie. Um, I think it was Police Squad, and uh, he inadvertently goes to the bathroom with this on, and of course all sorts of sounds and singing is taking place, and it shouldn't, and it's picked up by the person. There's been a lot of that in recent times, actually. You might have noticed Vladimir Putin got into himself trouble recently, not recently, actually, a few years ago, uh, with the Israeli premier. He left his mic on as well, started talking about a, a scandal in Israel, and uh, Gordon Brown, actually, if you look him up, one of the biggest uh, scandals of the 2010 general election when he left his mic on. So I'll just, just pull this off at the end. That's a long way of saying that. Um, okay, so it's wonderful to be here in Oslo. It's only my second time in Norway. And uh, I've come from Georgia, uh, just came yesterday, and uh, quite a contrast in, in weather and many other things. Um, I have to confess, and of course it's, it's Halloween uh, and a uh, good Celtic festival, so I hope not to scare anybody too much with my, my presentation. And uh, just to say a thank you to Helge for inviting me here. Um, this is a very, I think, exciting network, which has now been in existence for some years. And, uh, and thanks to Nupi, of course, for, for, for hosting me. And um, this is very much a work in progress over some years. Um, I'll, oh, yes, I move this here. Is this yeah, to the left? No one has shown me yet, but I'll, I'll assume it's... There we go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this has been a work in progress for some years, and uh, the, this, what you see today, is very much the product of the research I conducted at the request of my colleague in Dublin City University, Gizim Vesoka, uh, who's originally from Kosovo and uh, has done a lot of work on this, but uh, we've been colleagues in DCU uh, for more than a decade. Indeed, we first met in Tartu at the invitation of Ike Berg. We were at a common event there, so de facto states bringing people together, or at least research on de facto states. This is the book, the Routledge Handbook on State Recognition. It was edited by Gizim and also my other colleague, uh, John Doyle, and Edward Newman, and as you'll see in the very tiny print there, there's a chapter on Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and that was the chapter that I produced. And that kind of um, prepara preparing that chapter asked me to go beyond my uh, comfort zone 
because for, uh, I'll just go forward to that relevant slide. I've been researching Abkhazia for many years. I, I first moved to Tbilisi, I was just saying this to Tamta, 22 years ago, and, um, and I, I quickly became aware of Abkhazia and of South Ossetia and found ways to go there. So this was during, I think, one of my very first trips, which would have been, I guess, maybe the autumn of 2000 or the spring of, of 2021, when the only way you could get to Abkhazia was via the United Nations, which no longer exists now since 2008-9 in Abkhazia. That was the sign that I met for the first time as we crossed the Nguri. Uh, and I had to travel with this, uh, first by helicopter, I remember, from Tbilisi to Signaki, and then by UN car, and this is, I think, in Gali, as we were crossing the border. I was, I was, just, I was actually from the window of my car. So it was always difficult to get to, and still isn't that the easiest. Um, but the UN are no longer giving me a free ride as they used to back in the day, so now I have to uh, cross by, <laughs> by foot very unceremoniously. There was a horse in existence for some time or some kind of a, a beast that would bring you across if you were in, in, infirm, but I pre prefer to walk, not to put the animal under undue stress uh, with my luggage. And uh, it's quite a long bridge as anyone has crossed it will know about 800 meters takes you some time. But I haven't been unfortunately in Abkhazia for, for quite some years now. Um, the research I have been doing primarily has been on domestic politics. I think Helge, who we would be familiar with each other's work for some time, would know that I, I've been focusing on elections within Abkhazia over many years, parliamentary and presidential. I think the next slide might show something along those lines. Well, there's, there's the election of 2011, for example. I met with and interviewed the, the three major candidates and followed their uh, election campaigns, Alexander Angfab, Raul Hajimba, uh, and um, uh, Sergei Shamba. And I was back in 2014 when the, the two major candidates were uh, Raul Hajimba, who won on the fourth attempt, um, and, uh, and uh, Bajania, of course, who uh, is the current uh, incumbent, but that's him back in, in 2014. So as I said, it was asking me, when Gazim approached me and said, can you write something about the recognition process, it brought me more into geopolitics. I, I, I'm much more a micropolitics person. And, um, but in a way, it's an issue that we've been always familiar with to a certain extent in Ireland, and indeed I've been interested in. If I go back to that earlier slide, um, you know, because Ireland was once uh, a contested state. This is a, um, a note from the government, the delegation of the government of the Irish, the Republic of Ireland from 1919. But there was no recognised government of the Republic of Ireland in 1919. It was only internationally recognised in 1922. So they were turning up at the Paris Peace Conference in Versailles looking for recognition, but the doors weren't opened, of course, because uh, it was only a conference for the victorious powers. The losing empires found their empires broken up, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but we were part of the victorious British Empire. So there was no place for us at the table and no self-determination as per Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Um, so it's not something that's completely unfamiliar uh, to us, though I think a lot of Irish people would now forget that road that we took from a de facto state or a contested state to uh, full recognition. And, uh, and as I said, I was in Tbilisi, uh, oh, I'll just go back a little bit here for a moment, just to the, the just to I like this, this is my own map, I bought it in Tbilisi many years ago, what's interesting about it is, is that it doesn't conform with the borders today. This is a map from 1952, you might notice that uh, over here, north of Abkhazia, there's a huge bit of territory which includes Mount Elbrus, which was part of Georgia during Soviet times. Uh, and, uh, uh, and over here, this little part here is again enlarged. So Georgia had a bigger border for some time, a bigger, it was a bigger country for some time uh, during Soviet times. But once Stalin died, the borders contracted to what we now uh, associate with the internationally recognized borders of, 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 of Georgia. And, um, and it, that, that, that touches on a, a theme which is often prevalent in Abkhazia, for those of you that have visited Abkhazia, that they blame a lot of Abkhazia's woes historically, certainly during the 20th century, on Stalin. They would have seen this as Stalin's attempt to make Georgia greater, including again the largest mountain in Europe in Georgia's territories, but that, once he died, of course, that passed away, but his legacy lived on uh, in Abkhazia, because they always stress when you go there, at least they stressed when I went there in my initial visits, how Abkhazia had been a full Soviet socialist republic in the earlier stages of the Soviet Union and that status was diluted over time, which they attribute to Stalin because he was ethnically Georgian, though Georgians of course have no strong relationship with Stalin either in terms of affection, though I was in Tbilisi Drybridge Market on Saturday the day before yesterday and I found that there's such a demand for Stalin statues, I suspect from tourists, that uh, they are no longer able to get Soviet era ones and these ones which I think are made in 
China are, are on sale uh, throughout, and there's some more there. So you have these fake Stalin statues uh, on sale openly in Georgia, which I, I think is rather intriguing, uh, to put it mildly. And there is a visit I paid just again during the last week to the memorial in um, Tbilisi to those who died in the uh, Abkhazian War in 1992-1993. Now in Ireland we're very used to the whole idea of commemoration. We have a lot of wars, a lot of conflicts, and therefore I'm always interested in how wars are commemorated, what people remember and what they forget. For me what's interesting about this is that it's only the names of the, those who died for the United Georgia will say. Um, they're not all, the 99.9% .9 are ethnically Georgian. It was pointed out that there are six Ukrainian names on this, so they're not all Georgian, but the Abkhazians are not on this wall. Um, now, here's the, sim here's the same monument, more or less, dedicated to the, the, the war, but it's in Sukhumi, it's in Abkhazia, and they only have the names of the Abkhazian dead. Now, that makes sense if you're Abkhazian, because, of course, the Abkhazian are separatists. They don't want to be part of Georgia, so it makes sense that they wouldn't include the Georgians uh, on, on the list of their dead. But I always found it curious that the, 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 the Georgian monument in Tbilisi explicitly excludes the Abkhazians, who they would like to be reunited with one day, who they argue rhetorically are brothers and sisters. So it's just something that I, 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 I thought I would highlight since I visited as I just uh, the day before, before yesterday. And I'll have this map uh, with me as well throughout in case anybody wants to refer to, to, to anything in particular. Uh, but here is, again, for those who are less familiar with the region, the map of the area we're talking about. Uh, and... Um, there's a close-up, of course, of Abkhazia. It shows that airport, which, of course, hasn't been used uh, really since Soviet times. Most people entering uh, either come from uh, the Zugdidi direction, which is where I come from, or people sometimes come, particularly Russian tourists, uh, from the north via, via Sochi. And Abkhazia is many things to many people. I just put this out there to show that I am aware <laughs> of the diversity of names that are given. The, the most favored in academic circles, at least, uh, are unrecognized states and de facto states. But there is a long list, some of them more academic than others, some of them more legal than others, some of them more political than others. If you go down the list, of course, the term favored by the Georgian government explicitly since 2008 being uh, occupied uh, territory. Okay, so let's move forward a little bit to... Ah, yes, this is another favorite picture of mine. I'll throw it out there. I never get a, an affirmative answer, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Can anyone name... Well, no, that's too much to ask. Um, <laughs> can anyone name the, 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 the country uh, from which this person comes? He's the prime minister of a country. Very close, but... Tuvalu, Tuvalu, very, very good. Um, this is uh, ironically called Mr. Talavi <laughs> um, from Tuvalu. He was Prime Minister of Tuvalu in 2011, and here he is in, Suk in Sukumi uh, at the same time as the elections. That's why you see that little ballot box there with the, the vote going in. You can just see it there over here. And, and of, I, I, as, as I'll be coming to later, the population of Tuvalu is only about 10,500 people, so this is a statistically big section of the Tuvalu population and this other gentleman over here is their election observer who was sent to observe the election who by the way I was at the expo uh, the recent expo world expo in Dubai and I went to the uh, place the Tuvalu stand because I was intrigued to know what they were doing there and what they were selling and what they were promoting and it turns out that this man who is uh, the, for the former now uh, prime minister is now living in Hawaii because apparently if you have any connections at all you'd never spend the rest of your life in Tuvalu that was said to me with an air of resignation. Um, and this man, I think, went on to be Minister for Health. That's what the person at the stand told me. It's a very small society. Uh, these are very small states. And that's going to be important when we look at the idea of recognition. Why are these states recognizing Abkhazia? Who are they? It's important to know who they are. How, is, how are these decisions made? And the short answer is it's by a very small amount of people. They all know each other, family and friends, if you're living in an, in an island nation of 10,000 people. Um, but it go, and it will also show how arbitrary and political the process of recognition is. It's not really a legal process. This will be a, a point I'll make more than once, I guess. It's, it's very much a political uh, process, even geopolitical. Uh, and among the things that actually uh, President uh, or Prime Minister Talavi signed in Abkhazia was a visa-free uh, travel arrangement between Tuvalu and Abkhazia which again underlines the absurdity of that kind of particular relationship since Tuvalu has only about four or five thousand people uh, living, four or five thousand adults, and I don't think a large percentage of them uh, will be traveling to Abkhazia for holidays or for business, but yet these are the kinds of agreements that were being signed. 
Um, so yeah, I've, I've published quite extensively on these, on these issues. There's a, a selection, most of them again devoted to the internal politics of Abkhazia, but there is a forthcoming book um, uh, with Routledge on unrecognized states in the former Soviet space, which hopefully will be out in, 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 in next year, but uh, it will include primarily again uh, the internal dynamics rather than the external dynamics. So the overview of the presentation today, and I have very detailed slides, I, I won't obviously have the time to go through them in, 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 in great detail. I have the detail there in case somebody asks a particular question that I can refer back to it because I had to give this presentation in advance and um, I figured I'd have uh, put as much as I could up there in case anybody was uh, you're curious about any area in particular. But what I'll do is I've just briefly given the introduction and I'll go through essentially how, uh, rec you know, how efforts were made to secure international recognition for Abkhazia, particularly after Russia uh, took the lead in this respect in 2008, in, in August. So you have, and, uh, you have the U.S. attempts to, to censure Russia, um, you know, essentially to condemn uh, Russia's recognition of Abkhazia. That's what I'll look at briefly first. Then you see Russia and, of course, the Abkhazians moving into uh, Latin America, which is seen as fertile soil for potential recognitions. They do secure two, which still are there today, Nicaragua and Venezuela. Uh, under Daniel Ortega, of course, Nicaragua, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Um, then you have near misses, um, Ecuador, Bolivia, and the D Dominican Republic, which most people don't know, but came very close to recognizing Abkhazia uh, during this period, but were prevented uh, from doing so. And then you move, I move on to the post-Soviet sphere, which you would think was the area where Vladimir Putin could exert the most pressure, but ironically never got any recognitions for Abkhazia in the post-Soviet space, despite efforts, and they are well documented, or at least if you look hard enough, they, they, they can be found. And then finally, almost you might say, I wouldn't say necessarily out of desperation, but the last avenue available, perhaps the South Pacific, uh, where again, you get recognitions from Nauru, from Tuvalu, from Vanuatu. As we'll see, Tuvalu and Vanuatu withdraw that recognition. Nauru is still recognizing Abkhazia. Um, and, and a near miss of Fiji. Fiji came close, but again, like Ecuador, Bolivia, and Dominican Republic did not recognize, and then we'll bring things uh, to, to, to an end. So uh, let's look at those recognitions just briefly in terms of chronological order. Um, actually, I forgot to put in Syria there at the very end. Uh, Russia, of course, being the first, Russia recognizes Abkhazia on 26th of August 2008 uh, during the, the conflict, essentially, uh, which was primarily between Georgia and, and, and Russia. Um, then you have uh, Nicaragua following suit, very much an act of solidarity, as we'll see, between Ortega and uh, Vladimir Putin. Hugo Chavez, one year later, so a whole year passes, before the next recognition. I was in Abkhazia when that happened. I'll explain briefly what the atmosphere was like when we move on to that section. Um, Nauru then, uh, in around the same time, and then these smaller microstates following Vanuatu, Tuvalu, but both of those subsequently withdrawing. Look how, look how <laughs> flip-flopping <laughs> Vanuatu is, back and forward in a, in, a, in a short space of time. It won't come as a surprise to you, perhaps, that these South Pacific islands are uh, veterans of the China-Taiwan uh, recognition wars. So they have at times recognized Taiwan and then being counter, uh, getting, given a counter proposal by China and withdrawn that recognition and recognized China and sometimes back again. Um, so, so they have done with Abkhazia uh, um, you know, during the last few years. And then just as we thought that momentum had been lost, if this is momentum, uh, Syria you know, in 2018, which as I'll argue is very much a, an act of gratitude on behalf of the uh, Syrian dictator for Russia's help uh, uh, during the conflict there. Though that's not, of course, how the Abkhazians would see it. They, of course, put in, they did put in their own efforts, and this is an important thing to stress. It's not all Russia, but I will, I will argue that the doors open only because of Russia. The Abkhazians go in, they make their case, but as I said with the Irish in 1919, you don't get the door open <laughs> unless geopolitics is in your favor. Um, and then, uh, finally, there are those recognitions afforded by other post-Soviet de facto states. Um, so, of course, Transnistria and South Ossetia recognize Abkhazia. Um, and where does Abkhazia then fit in the global picture? Um, there's, there's kind of a, you might say, the, the league table. Uh, if we look at contemporary cases, there have been historical cases, of course. We had Chechnya, remember Chechnya? I mean, it used to be a de facto state for a couple of years. There was Biafra, now part of Nigeria. There was Katanga in the Congo. So they usually lasted for short periods of time. What's interesting about our cases that we look at uh, globally is that they've been there usually for a couple of decades. And therefore, they are, if not a permanent feature of the global system, certainly uh, a substantial one that's been around for some time. So you have those at the bottom of the table, 
uh, that are non-UN member states, that are not recognized by any other state in the world, be they recognized or non-recognized. That would be Somaliland before 2020. What happens in 2020 is Taiwan recognizes Somaliland. But of course, Taiwan is also not a recognized UN member state. So you get that unrecognized states recognizing other unrecognized states. Similarly, Nagorno-Karabakh and Transnistria have only secured recognition from uh, other uh, unrecognized states. They don't have a patron that will recognize them, even though, for example, Nagorno-Karabakh gets so much support from Armenia, but Armenia has not formally recognized ever Nagorno-Karabakh. Then you move on to uh, those who have at least one UN member state which recognizes them, but less than 10. Um, so this is where Abkhazia fits in. It's, it's close to the bottom, but not nothing. It's got five recognitions at the moment. Um, you have South Ossetia, and you also have Northern Cyprus, which is only, of course, one recognition, that of Turkey. Um, and then you move on to, you might say, the senior league, kind of the premier league, uh, those non-UN member states who are recognized by at least 10 UN member states, they being Kosovo, which is more now than 100, um, despite not being a UN member state. You have Taiwan, which is ever reducing. It's down to about a dozen now. It used to be 20 something just a few years ago, but one by one, China is picking them off uh, by kind of different forms of leverage. You have Palestine, which again has a lot of recognitions, but not UN member status, and you have the Western Sahara region. So you can see there that this is a, it's a phenomenon. Abkhazia is part of a phenomenon that's taking place. Um, it does have some recognitions, but not as many as others, but better than, than some that in the, are in the same situation. And I, I actually know now why I'm a little bit more, less assured of what's coming next, because usually I'm on my Mac computer and I can always see the next slide, so I'm, I'm kind of now guessing <laughs> what's in front of me here. Uh, focus and sources. This is just to tell you essentially how I did the research. Um, I, 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 I've already explained to you that I focus mainly on the internal politics. I don't look at South Ossetia. The chapter that Gizim asked me to write did focus also on South Ossetia, but South Ossetia is so different from Abkhazia in so many ways. Um, I'm not the first to point out, Tom Deval has, George Toll has, that you know, they have different objectives, to put it mildly. South Ossetia has no desire really to be independent. It wants to be part of North Ossetia and therefore part of the Russian Federation. The Abkhaz genuinely do want to be independent, but are unable to achieve that, and certainly unable to achieve widespread recognition. And that makes them very different cases from the very beginning. Um, and then you have the differences in population. You know, South Ossetia is probably only about 35, 40,000 people, you know, a suburb of Oslo. Uh, Abkhazia, not huge, but at about a quarter million, more significant. And there's a whole range of other differences, their natural resources, uh, their histories and whatnot. So I don't focus on South Ossetia, and it's sometimes frustrating that they're always lumped together as if they're absolutely, you know, the same, and I would argue they're quite different. In the same way that, you know, Sweden and Somalia are both uh, recognized states, but have a lot of of differences as well. Uh, how did I get information? Not easy, because you know this is a very secret process. It's often money under the table. Obviously, I didn't get people to confess, yes, I handed over a lot of money to Tuvalu, and that's why they recognize. My main source uh, is WikiLeaks. Uh, which is a, it's, it is tapped, but I think it's still a largely underused resource for academics. Uh, John O'Loughlin, my compatriot, wrote an interesting article some years ago arguing why academics should use WikiLeaks more, um, because let's face it, it's a huge cache of diplomatic documents um, that you would not otherwise have access to. So the perspective I'm giving you is quite an American one in a respect. It's, it's saying how they try to counter what they saw around the world in terms of recognition for Abkhazia, but it's still very useful. They pick up a lot of information as embassies do because they have people everywhere, um, unlike the Irish diplomatic network, which is rather curtailed. Um, and then you've, you, you had an article by Ike Berg and Scott Pegg some years ago where they looked at some of the WikiLeaks documents, uh, those with uh, Abkhazia or Transnistria in the title, and, and they, they, therefore, it was, a, it was a couple of hundred documents, and they looked to see what it told us about uh, U.S. relations with those, with those entities. Uh, I've looked at every single document that touches on recognition um, and, and that touches on, uh, again, those unrecognized states, particularly Abkhazia. And then I complemented it by doing some interviews with people on the ground. So I interviewed, in particular, Maxim Vinja, who was the Abkhaz uh, head of foreign affairs for some years. He had been Sergei Shamba's deputy uh, in, in the 2000s, and then he, he, he was promoted uh, once Shamba became uh, PM. And then um, uh, Vacheslav Chirikba, who was his successor. Uh, 
so together they held the foreign affairs portfolio in Abkhazia for about a decade. So, and, and this is when most of these recognitions were taking place. So I felt that it would be at least useful to get uh, their, their, their perspective on what they were doing to secure recognition. And I also interviewed uh, officials in Georgia uh, because of Georgia was involved in a counter-recognition initiative, often with US support. A lot of it's documented in WikiLeaks, but I wanted again to get the Georgian government's perspective on, on what they were doing during this time to counteract all, all of this. So, I'll just move along swiftly to the US attempts to censure Russia. In a nutshell, as it is in, in a way with the, 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 the Russia's war on Ukraine right now, you know, you get those who are passionately against uh, Russian aggression in the case of Ukraine, you are those who are, are, are kind of like a very small number who are actively in favor uh, of Russia's actions, and then you get like this large indifferent kind of, not necessarily a majority, but at least half of the world who just don't care very much about what's going on. It's far away from us. This is a European situation. And, uh, and so it was back in 2008, where you know, the US was, was going around the world using its embassies, trying to get you know, condemnations of Russia's actions, uh, going to countries like uh, Vietnam and Burkina Faso, which had non-permanent membership of the UN at the time, and saying, you should condemn these actions. You should say you recognize Georgia's territorial integrity. You condemn these recognitions. And they didn't get very far with these countries. Uh, the response they got, for example, from Vietnam was they blamed Saakashvili, the president of Georgia, for what happened. And they said, you know, this is a direct result of the US-led uh, recognition of Kosovo. Uh, which had happened only in February 2008. So Russia's recognition of Abkhazia is in August 2008, and you have the US and Western countries, including my own native Ireland, recognizing Kosovo in February uh, 2008. So it, they saw that as part of a larger picture that shouldn't be treated in isolation. Burkina Faso just simply saw this as a new Cold War, and that anything that the Burkina Faso said wouldn't change anything on the ground, but it might attract negative repercussions for Burkina Faso from Russia. So they just didn't want to get involved. Um, in some places like Kenya, um, the US did, at least they felt, play a, a, a positive role. Uh, the, Kenya, the Kenya government, they didn't know much about what was going on, and the US filled them in, and they, they did know enough to say, how is the situation different from Kosovo? And the US assured them that it was, and the Kenyans seemed satisfied with the explanation that Kosovo was a, a special case. But the, the key takeaway here is the vast majority of the world, what you might call the silent majority, the indifferent center, couldn't be induced to either recognize Abkhazia, which is what Russia wanted, or to condemn Russia recognition of it, which is what, of course, uh, Georgia, the US, the European Union uh, wanted. So moving on to Latin America. Um, Latin America, a lot of left-wing governments were elected in the decade before Russia's recognition. Nine uh, left-wing governments, in fact, and that was helpful from Russia's perspective. Some of them were veterans of the Cold War struggles. Daniel Ortega is a great example. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Sandinista government uh, in the, the 1980s. I mean, that was Daniel Ortega. Uh, he was getting, you know, resources from the Soviet Union. So, you know, he liked the idea of this bipolar competition because he was instinctively anti-American, so he needed support from elsewhere. Russia was the obvious counterbalance as the Soviet Union had been. So he, he was one of those um, uh, who kind of entertained this diluted form of geopolitical competition which had existed since the Cold War. So uh, from the US perspective, the US Embassy in Managua said that recognition of Abkhazia had everything to do with strengthening Ortega's relationship with Russia. In other words, it had nothing to do with the merits of Abkhazia's case, uh, such as it is. It had all to do with the geopolitics um, and that Ortega has fondly recalled the Cold War era Moscow support for the Nicaraguan revolution. Um, um, he also thought it was a very cheap way of perhaps enticing Russia to give military assistance and economic aid. Um, Hugo Chavez, as I mentioned to you, I was in Venezuela, I was not in Venezuela, I've never been in Venezuela, I was in Abkhazia in, in 2009 uh, when that happened. And what was interesting was how underwhelming the mood was. You would expect it being only the third recognition. I mean, there were huge celebrations when Russia recognized Abkhazia, but you would, not have, uh, you would not have noticed that anything unusual had happened that day. There were no fireworks, no champagne openings. People on the ground in Abkhazia felt, you know, unlike Russia, that this was game-changing for them and they had a certain affinity with Russia in some respects. It, it, it was clearly transactional. Hugo Chavez didn't even visit Abkhazia. He was in Moscow when he made the announcement. He was there 
as part of a package, uh, a deal where he got cheap weapons, I think it was valued to about two billion for Venezuela, and like thrown into the mix was recognition of Abkhazia uh, as well. So that was, that was felt by people on the ground, that this was not really uh, one that was based on merit. And, the, and I, I should point out that the Abkhazians that I certainly encountered and met and interviewed had almost sometimes a naive innocence about the international world, that they kind of felt that their case was so strong, um, that they were like a nation looking for independence, that you know, anyone who was genuinely interested in justice would like to see the merits of their case and you know were then disappointed when, when they would go out into the big bad world and find that that's not how uh, the world uh, worked. Um, if you look at the ones that got away as I said in the region Ecuador, Bolivia and Dominican Republic in a nutshell because I know I have to keep an eye on time or oh, just, just one point is important though Spain was very important in, in, in Latin America as it was the most important after the US in terms of EU countries certainly Spain proved to be a particularly useful ally for Georgia in applying pressure because of course being a Spanish speaking region uh, Spain had particular diplomatic networks uh, and also just to point out that the Georgian government finally woke up to the threat in South America and started doing a tour of uh, Latin American capitals in November 2009. Um, but why, why did Ecuador and, and, and uh, Bolivia back away at the last minute? In a nutshell, I won't go through the details, in a nutshell it was the premature announcements by the Abkhaz. The Abkhaz had come close with Russian, of course, uh, active support to securing those recognitions, but they were announced publicly in April, do I have to quote there? Yes, in April 2010, uh, the Abkhazian MFA uh, announced that they were waiting for Bolivia and Ecuador to recognize the independence of Abkhazia soon. That provided an opportunity for the US and the EU to you know, get their act together, to move in there and persuade, in adverted commas, uh, the governments uh, of Ecuador and Bolivia not to recognize uh, Abkhazia, and as uh, Vacheslav Chirikba said to me in the interview I conducted with him, the recognitions of the Republic were thwarted several times because they were declared too early. So in other words, if they just kept quiet, you know, quelled their enthusiasm, it might have happened, as it had happened in Venezuela, for example. But because they announced it too early, the US was given an opportunity to apply pressure. What kind of pressure that was? Again, Maxim Vinja in particular, uh, the, 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 the former uh, head of the Abkhazian MFA, um, is, is particularly forthright in explaining what happens. I, I love this colorful uh, explanation here, where more or less he says that he had, he had secured recognition, and then the US ambassador calls in. There are shouts, yelling, I come the next day, I already know what's happened. Sorry, they say the ambassador was here. Hillary Clinton phoned, screamed, and shouted expletives. And they said, if, you re if we recognize Abkhazia, the US will close all its programs. We will leave your country. We will stop financing you. We will break off all relations with you altogether. Um, and further down, um, he mentions something similar. Oh, this is yeah, an interview I conducted with him in the early stages in 2011, where he more or less said, look, I've already made great progress. But everywhere I go, just as I'm on the verge, the US and the European Union their influence blocks me. And that if it was a fair fight, this is, this is his quote, if they would give me a fair game, I can play a fair game, I could get many more countries to recognize us. But ultimately, I'm up against much bigger powers. That was the perspective of the Abkhazians, that they were just essentially not as well resourced as their opponents in securing recognitions. Dominican Republic, again, very close. There were, again, it's now obscured by history, but there were at least three occasions in April, May 2011, when the US government warned Santo Domingo, the government of Dominican Republic, against recognizing Abkhazia. Uh, and indeed, there was an official delegation from the Dominican Republic's deputy prime minister to Abkhazia in May of that year. So it did look like they were close to recognizing. But uh, again, going back to uh, uh, the ever frank Maxim Gvinja, he said, uh, and I, I did, by the way, independently verify that, that he was summoned uh, for a conference in New York, So, because I said this is almost too implausible to believe. So according to, to Maxim Gvinja, the US government summoned President Fernandez to New York ostensibly for a conference and sent a private plane for that purpose. And then Gvinja says, I do not know what they did to him, but after that, he was even afraid to answer my emails, um, which is, again, a wonderful quote. Um, but I, I mean, and again, I can't verify that beyond the interview, but what what I can say is that Fernandez did go to New York around this time, so that part uh, is independently uh, verifiable. So let's move away from Latin America, the post-Soviet region. Um, 
there was a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on the 28th of August, so very shortly after, after Russia recognized Abkhazia. This was an ideal platform for Putin to push his case among those who should have been closest to him, China, the Central Asian countries and whatnot. From Chinese perspective, there was very little incentive to support Russia. Russia as China has its own secessionist problems, Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, so they had no incentive to, to help Russia in this respect. Um, the president of Tajikistan, uh, Rahman, uh, later confided to the US Under Secretary William Burns that the summit had been tough because the Russians had applied huge pressure on a country like Tajikistan, which is very dependent on Russia, to recognize Abkhazia uh, and South Ossetia. Rahman, like many others, of course, blamed Saakashvili. He said it was his poor judgment that had led to the debacle. Um, but ultimately, Tajikistan did not, despite the huge pressure from Russia, recognize Abkhazia. And that was considered a victory from the US perspective. They argued that let's not push Tajikistan any more on this. Getting them not to recognize is a victory for us because they're so close and so dependent uh, on, on Russia. Belarus, the game changer, I call it here, because Belarus was, and we still know is, the post-Soviet country closest to Russia. If you couldn't get Belarus to recognize Abkhazia, uh, you were never going to get perhaps much chance with any others. Georgia was obsessed with the, and I know this from being in Georgia at the time, meeting with government officials, they thought that Belarus was on the verge of recognizing, and they were right. Uh, indeed, according to Lukashenko himself, who's not shy, again, about advertising his intentions to the media, uh, he said afterwards that he had agreed to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia. He'd given a commitment to the Russian government, um, but as he himself said, uh, and I have the relevant quote coming up here, I'll just bring it up at this moment. He had a meeting with Medvedev, and this is on the record, by the way, this is not a, from a, he had a meeting with Medvedev, and he said, look, I promised, you know, to, I gave a solemn pledge to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but then I said to Medvedev, there will be consequences for Belarus. Um, you know, are you ready, Mr. President, to share these consequences together with us? Are you ready to put your shoulder to ours? And Medvedev's response, I quote, Lukashenko quotes, let's stop this horse trading. This is one issue, that is, support for Belarus from Russia, and that's another, being recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And I said, so Lukashenko said to Medvedev, now the issue is closed, thanks very much, there's no continuation of the conversation. So in his word, so Belar I mean, Lukashenko, who as we know is a wily navigator uh, of, of stormy waters, he was trying to get something for, from, for Belarus from this, and it was clear that he wasn't getting enough. And he was right that the EU would have um, imposed sanctions on Belarus, and he would have needed additional support, and he felt that he wasn't getting enough reassurance from Russia that they would help him uh, buffet the storms that were about to come. So, you know, and I noticed at the time, those of you that were in Georgia or familiar with Georgia and politics at the time, there was a huge change of emphasis in the Georgian government towards Belarus around 2010. Up until that point, the government led by Saakashvili was intensely critical of Lukashenko. Indeed, some of my uh, friends in Georgia who were involved in things like Kamara, who had gone to train um, Belarusian activists, were imprisoned for some time there. And suddenly, things shifted and they started arguing to the EU that they should have closer relations with Belarus because, again, they were so much uh, indebted for the fact that Lukashenko had not recognized Abkhazia or South Ossetia. So I argue that this is a real turning point in the whole recognition game, if we can call it that, that once Belarus is persuaded that it's not, or Lukashenko rather, since it's a dictatorship, I shouldn't be saying Belarus all the time, since Lukashenko is persuaded um, that it's not in his interest to recognize Abkhazia, that is a watershed moment, I would argue. Um, then we move on to the South Pacific. Um, which is again the, the, the recognition place of last resort. When you can't get a recognition from anywhere in the world, go to the South Pacific. As I said, they're veterans of the whole Taiwan-China recognition spat. And in the past, the Solomon Islands, Palau, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Nauru and Tuvalu have all recognized Taiwan. And they're the kind of countries that Russia was targeting uh, in particular, um, you know, that because these would be ones that could be for a relatively small fee induced uh, to, 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 to recognize uh, Abkhazia or South Ossetia or both. Uh, these are certainly cases where recognition is bought rather, rather than owned uh, or earned. Um, let's look at them briefly. Nauru, 21 square kilometers, a population just over 10,000. The nearest place is Kiribati, which is another microstate, 300 kilometers away. 
It's a country without a capital, it has no military, it doesn't have a national currency, it has an 18-member parliament, but you can imagine if you've only got 10,000 people, it's largely friends and family voting for each other, and they have, of course, uh, you know, uh, recycling of elites uh, over time, rival families. Uh, it only joined the United Nations uh, 20 years ago, and, um, and Russia's approach to Nauru timed with a period of unprecedented economic vulnerability. For years, they had made a lot of money from phosphate, then the phosphate mining ran out, they had simply no more phosphate, and they were hugely economically vulnerable. So in steps Russia with the proposal, and um, you know, there have, it, it, their position is so bad that there have been uh, suggestions over the years, not only with Nauru, by the way, but with Tuvalu, that the whole population should just simply be moved somewhere because the, the, the global warming with the rising tides uh, threatens the islands to be just simply submerged with water. Let me show you a picture to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is Nauru. This is a UN member state. <laughs> I know I can see some people with the eyes wide open there. This is a UN member state with as much rights in the UN as a country like Ireland or Norway. Um, there it is, with 10,000 people, as you can see, hugging this part here. There's their, their um, airline strip um, there, and that's, that's Tuvalu. Uh, sorry, that's Nauru. Nauru, they look so alike, because I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you Tuvalu in a moment. Um, so they recognized in 2009, but the U.S. government says that uh, the Georgians were much more relaxed about Nauru than they had been about Venezuela, which had occurred shortly before. Venezuela being, of course, a serious country, you might say a big country, Nauru, uh, somewhat less significant. Um, unlike Tuvalu and Vanuatu, Nauru has stayed the course. They still recognize uh, Abkhazia, and um, indeed in 2013, uh, Nauru's foreign minister visited Abkhazia, and in 2017, the president of Nauru became the first non-Russian head of state to visit uh, Abkhazia. But as I've said earlier, these meetings were largely superficial in character, um, you know, things like visa-free treaties, and again, how often would they be of any relevance to anybody in Abkhazia or in uh, Nauru? Tuvalu, similarly, uh, only joined the UN 20-odd years ago. Again, about 20-something square kilometers, 10,000 people, a 12-seat parliament. Um, and uh, I mentioned to you that, yes, Prime Minister Talavi visited Sukumi in 2011. That's where I met him and his election observer. Um, and at the same time, again, the Georgian government begins to wake up to the threat here, and they start sending the foreign minister to the South Pacific and, and, and start having bilateral relations with countries in the region. And um, and, and go on tours uh, of, of, of the region to counteract uh, the Russian uh, diplomatic efforts uh, there. Um, there's Tuvalu. Uh, as you can see, it's just a, a couple of islands. That's the main one. That's the biggest island by far. And look, the airplane strip takes up a lot of the, uh, the biggest island. Uh, so again, about 10,000 people living there. Then we move on to Vanuatu. Again, like Nauru and Tuvalu, small and isolated. A more substantial population, indeed a population about the size of Abkhazia, about 250,000 people. Um, they flip-flop mainly because of internal politics within Vanuatu. Despite being relatively small, they have quite a divided political elite, and they tend to go back and forward on these issues uh, once they change uh, government. So you have this, again, multiple flip-flopping on Abkhazia, but they had also done that with Taiwan uh, in previous times. And then there's the one that got away, uh, Fiji. Uh, this is a really important statistic for me. I, 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 as I said, interviewed members of the Georgian diplomatic community at the time. Um, during the four years following the 2008 war, Georgia established diplomatic relations with no less than 50 UN member states. So there were 50 UN member states that Georgia had no diplomatic relations with. They were obvious targets for anyone wanting to get recognition for Abkhazia uh, or South Ossetia. So they quickly started establishing very, very quickly uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, and, and Fiji is an example. They only established relations with Fiji in March 2010. And shortly afterwards, this tiny nation was honored by a visit by Georgian Foreign Minister Vashadze. Um, and, uh, and Fiji was in a vulnerable place at the time as well. It had been kicked out of uh, or suspended from the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth and the Pacific Islands Forum because of a coup in 2006. So this diplomatic isolation made it uh, a potential target for new friends, particularly those bearing gifts. And uh, indeed, Sergei Lavrov paid a visit. So the Georgian and the Russian foreign ministers visiting Fiji, a very insignificant South Pacific island, uh, multi-island nation, um, you know, in, in, in a very short space of time. And you can be sure that Abkhazia was on the agenda of both. Well, indeed, it was the primary agenda for, for the Georgian uh, Foreign Minister Vachazze in particular. And uh, to, to fight temptation with temptation, um, because, of course, the Georgian government, the, the, the Deputy Foreign Minister in 2012, openly 
asked the Fijians to, in his own words, resist the temptation to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But just in case words were not enough, the Georgian government gifted the schools of Fiji with hundreds of computer netbooks and numerous scholarships for Fijian students. So, you know, Georgia also was willing to spend a bit of money on, on uh, the recognition uh, game uh, during this period as well. And that's from the Fijian government's website. So you can check more information about that uh, there. And finally, we're moving on to Syria, uh, which is the kind of one that came out of nowhere, surprisingly in a way. But then when you think about Russian-Syrian relations, it all makes sense. From the Abkhazian perspective, I interviewed the, uh, the foreign minister the, 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 of the time, uh, Chirikba. Um, he, of course, emphasizes the Abkhazian relationship with Syria historically, culturally, and of course he had met his Syrian counterparts. But he does acknowledge, and I think, of course, this perhaps is understating it, but he at least was willing to say that, well, of course, Russia was a strong factor. You know, but the Abkhaz uh, side too was very active diplomatically. And that's largely true. I mean, in, in the sense of the Abkhaz, which are, of course, small in number and politically, uh, you might say, almost insignificant in international affairs, they, but they, they did send their own people out to these places to, to, to meet people, to, to sign the documents and all that. But I think the key point is how those doors were opened. And that's something that we'll never entirely get to the bottom of, but I hope I've already given you some idea of, of how and why it occurs. And, uh, and back to Belarus. This is a photograph from just, uh, now I'm just looking at about a month ago. Uh, this is Al Alexander Lukashenko, president of Belarus in Abkhazia. So all during this time of flirting with Abkhazian recognition in 2009, 2010, he never visited. Now, 2022, just a month ago, here he is with uh, Bajania in, in, uh, in Abkhazia. So you have to ask yourself, what is this all about? Is Belarus now on the verge of recognizing Abkhazia. Is it because Belarus is so beholden to Putin because of the war in Ukraine that perhaps finally Putin will get this Belarus recognition of Abkhazia? I spoke with my Belarusian contacts about this and they had a very interesting um, narrative. They said that in the Belarusian media, whereas the Abkhaz of course emphasized this a lot, um, and you know it was very positive publicity for the Abkhazian political elite. In Belarus, it was hardly given any publicity, and it was not presented in the same way. So it was it was presented in the Belarusian official media almost as if Lukashenko was just visiting. They used the term Black Sea a lot. They didn't often mention Abkhazia. It was like Black Sea historical resorts, and and the meeting with Bijani was always you know mentioned that he happened to meet some people along the way. There was certainly no official meeting. It was it was downplayed definitely in the Belarusian media. So it seems that Lukashenko, not for the first time, was trying to have the best both worlds, that he was giving Putin a little bit of what he wanted, but also trying to say that, look, I have some room for maneuverability, I haven't recognized Abkhazia, and indeed my Belarusian contacts suggested that he's not on the verge of recognizing Abkhazia, this was just simply being seen to do something under pressure. And also sending a signal to the West that he, he hasn't gone and done all that he's been asked to do, and that he, has, he retains power uh, and, 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 and whatnot, which is a classic Lukashenko strategy over the years. Um, so just we, 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 we've been talking all along about official recognition just to say that the Abkhazians are also interested in unofficial or non-state recognition. They have been somewhat successful in the realm of sport in this regard. They had the World Domino Championships. I'm not a domino follower, but for those of you that are, the World Domino uh, Championships were held uh, about a decade ago. In, in Abkhazia, not a many nations participate in that. I think about a, maybe 10 or 12. I remember the Nicaraguans were there and the Venezuelans as well. Um, they've also signed agreements with territorial subunits um, you know, so like, you know, city-states, uh, particularly in Italy, they have some success in this regard, where they kind of, kind of city-to-city uh, agreements, for example, or trade, uh, chambers of commerce. So like the Chamber of Commerce in Sukumi might have a, an agreement with uh, another uh, part of the, the, the world. And uh, my, my uh, former PhD researcher and, 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 and fantastic scholar Giorgio Kamai has done a lot of good work on that, of, of, of showing how um, this form of kind of power diplomacy or kind of, you know, sub-state sub diplomacy has been undertaken by uh, places like Abkhazia. And then, of course, as I've mentioned before, there's recognition from other unrecognized states. These photographs here, by the way, showing, uh, I, I didn't mention Kanifa. Kanifa is this confederation, it's the unrecognized states version of FIFA. So, of course, FIFA is made up of recognized football associations. If you're not in that, you have this confederation of independent football associations, which is CONIFA, and Abkhazia hosted the CONIFA World Cup um, in 2016. There's its official logo. They actually won the championship, and they were genuinely over the moon. I mean, like it was like winning the real World Cup. I mean, there was absolute hysteria in Abkhazia for, for some time. Um, because, of course, they're not a UN member state, anybody who is uh, a sporting, uh, 
uh, hero has to go and either be an independent athlete or be represent, represent Russia in the Olympics. So here's an Abkhaz bronze medalist. I was actually in Abkhazia. I took these photographs in 2012 when the Olympics were in London, and he got a bronze medal, but he had to participate for Russia. Um, they were, of course, treating him as the local hero, and he would have liked, of course, uh, so the local narrative goes to have represented Abkhazia in the United Na uh, not in the United, in the Olympic Games, but it wasn't uh, possible. Um, ah, yes, and then these are examples of this non-state recognition to other non-state recognition. This is the Abkhazian and South Ossetian uh, representative offices in Tiraspol, in Transnistria. Uh, Helgabe, probably you've been there at least, yes, so you, you recognize the building. So, and in there you have, here he is, the Abkhazian representative to Transnistria. Um, and uh, who is to save money from Transnistria? <laughs> He's not actually from Abkhazia, though he has a long-standing relationship with Abkhazia and he visits many times. Uh, as you can see, I visited during the time when Hajimba was the leader in, in, in Abkhazia. And, um, but he, he performs the functions on behalf of Abkhazia in Transnistria. He goes to official ceremonies, opens things, things like that. And here you have a meeting of the four heads. This is now from some years ago. The four heads, uh, the foreign heads, uh, foreign, foreign affairs heads of of, of, of Abkhazia, of Nagorno-Karabakh, of Transnistria and South Ossetia, all meeting for a summit of unrecognized uh, foreign affairs leaders. Okay, so we've come to the end, and I'm just going to say in conclusion um, that there is an obvious extreme asymmetry in the relationship between Russia and Abkhazia. Um, that, of course, causes tensions within Abkhazia. That's a story for another day, of course, but it's an important thing to stress. It's no, no more important now, actually, when Russia is trying to buy up an important part of real estate in Abkhazia, and there's great Abkhazian resistance to this, but what leverage do they have in the real world, you might argue? Um, so this, uh, this asymmetry and the lack of options that Abkhaz, the Abkhaz political elite have, they don't have many friends internationally. So th this asymmetry combined with their status as a de facto state, not a de Yore state has led to a very high level of dependence on Moscow, and this is extended to efforts to secure international recognition. Um, the Abkhazians genuinely, as I said, I cannot question the, 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 the sincerity of purpose of those representing the Abkhazian political elite in their quest to get further recognition for, for, for their uh, state. Um, but, you know, Moscow is the decisive element in securing breakthroughs. Uh, this is not because of the Abkhaz try, but their efforts are only successful if and when Moscow can make the breakthrough for them. Uh, so the criteria for recognition, and this is no revelation to those of you who've been studying de facto states over the years, the criteria are very vague, under-regulated, decentralized. Recognition is almost always a political act rather than a legal one. It's, it's, and that's a key takeaway. Um, so, you know, a simple example is like, you know, it's often pointed out that Somaliland is a more stable and peaceful entity than Somalia, from which it seceded 30 years ago. But Somalia, no matter how much it fails, will always be recognized, and Somaliland, no matter how successful it is, will never be recognized, or at least there's no, there's no obvious path uh, for recognition for a country like uh, Somaliland. Um, and despite the relatively recent addition of Syria to its diplomatic networks, uh, Abkhazia's recognitions are vulnerable, okay? The, those provided by Nicaragua and Venezuela were very much the personal initiatives of Daniel Ortega and Hugo Chavez. Daniel Ortega is still there, but Nicaragua is very unstable politically. Hugo Chavez is gone, his successor is in power, but again, I would argue that the Chavez regime, its days are numbered. So once those regimes change in Nicaragua and Venezuela, I would contend it's very likely you will see those recognitions withdrawn. I don't think they're long-term recognitions. Um, it's unlikely that, uh, yeah, that's the point I made there. And, and then attempting aid package to Nauru, because as I mentioned, South Pacific Islands, they're open to change their minds for money. Uh, so attempting aid package for Nauru, along with a change of government in Syria, and you might find that Abkhazia is back to uh, a solitary endorsement from its patron Russia. That is, of course, if Russia survives. Uh, we, we live in very fluid times when we don't know the outcome of this war, what it will mean for, for, for Russia. So that, of course, would have huge implications for Abkhazia Let's, uh, and, 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 and for Georgia. As I mentioned, I just came back from Tbilisi. I would be lying if I didn't say there's a certain optimism in Georgia about if the outcome of the war is, is detrimental for Russia, the implications of Georgia... Um, acquiring Abkhazia, um, that's there. Uh, there's talk about that. Um, the government has tried to dampen, um, you know, enthusiasm for this, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely happening. So, whereas we've, we've called these conflicts for some time, um, maybe this is a point to finish on, and I know that people in the region don't like the term frozen conflicts. I think that certainly the current 
war um, taking place because of Russia's invasion or reinvasion of Ukraine has certainly created a certain fluidity in many of the areas that de facto st or scholars of de facto states look at. Nagorno-Karabakh, I don't think it's any coincidence that Azerbaijan has reignited conflict with Armenia uh, during this uh, war in Ukraine. Um, you look at the situation in Transnistria, all of these things are now in a way more fluid than they were a year ago, and that's something that we have to acknowledge as well. So uh, on that note, I will conclude. I probably went a little bit over time, sorry for that, but uh, hopefully it was comprehensive. And uh, yes, Helge, I this, will you moderate the questions and answers? You will. Should I stand here? I no, I should. Here, but okay. Uh, we just uh, rearrange the seat slightly. Ah, okay. Okay. So uh, we'll open up the floor for, for questions and comments. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with one uh, of my own. Um, you quoted uh, the former ministers of foreign affairs, Gwenja and Tirikpa, uh, and, and they gave the impression that there was quite a bit of uh, um, local agency involved. But, but uh, you, you partly answered that in, in your conclusion, but how much can uh, the facto state achieve on its own without uh, a strong patron? Uh, is this all Moscow's work, or, or does it really matter what uh, local actors uh, try to achieve? How, do they have a role at all? Of course, th yeah, this, this brings us into things like realist and, and, and idealist versions of international relations. To the Abkhaz, it matters. I think, again, just we bring it to bring it to the local, which I've been familiar with for some time, it's a matter of pride for them to, to make their case. They genuinely believe it. Um, you know, they are a nation, uh, and as I said, it's a path that many have gone on before, uh, including the Irish. Uh, you know, you're unrecognized, you struggle for your independence. So, in a way, the number of recognitions, and that's why I said Venezuela recognized them, didn't really do anything for the Abkhaz, because they realized it wasn't based in merit, but they try. Uh, they're rather cynical about the international world. You couldn't blame them. Um, they do believe that it's all about networks, about power, and it's not about justice, um, but they, they persevere. So uh, if you are in Abkhazia, I mean, it, it, it matters a lot um, that they, they put the effort in and they have a, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs which represents them and, 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 and has international contacts. But in the real world, outside of Abkhazia, you might say, um, it matters very little, um, if not at all. Um, and you know, they, they do take an active interest in Abkhazia in the case of Scotland, for example, in Catalonia. I know for a fact they've reached out to those administrations. They haven't been reciprocated. Um, it's interesting, as, 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 as nations get closer to recognition, they start trying to distance themselves from those who have less of a chance. So, you know, you won't have the Scots or the Catalans engaging with Abkhazia. They want to be engaging with recognized states, not unrecognized states. Um, so, so, no, it, it, it was very much a Russian initiative from, you know, a Russian-led initiative. But I know that Max Vinger, for example, he was in Latin America, he went to Venezuela, he went to Nicaragua. Um, you know, so it's not that like Russia was there and did everything for them. But as I said, to use the metaphor, Russia knocked on the door, Russia got prior acceptance, and, and, and that was the, the key determinant uh, in these things taking place. But, you know, for formalities and also for pride's sake, the Abkhaz were the ones who ultimately did the, you know, they had the face-to-face the -face meetings, they did sign the documents, all that worked in parallel. Price tag. Uh, I think I saw 30 million uh, related to Taiwan, uh, but but what has? Do you know an, uh, what Russia has paid for these uh, recognitions? There was a rumor, but it's it's unconfirmed. Uh, 50 million for Tuvalu, um, but as I said, that was withdrawn. Um, so. It's not, it's not huge, the money, but, you know, that may be one of the reasons why they withdrew it as well. Um, so, but it seems that it's the tens of millions rather than the hundreds of millions for microstates. Uh, these are very small entities. Um, I mean, Tuvalu makes a lot of money, or at least some money, from simply selling its internet domain. So you probably don't know this, but uh, the internet domain for, so Norway is N-O, Ireland is I-E, Tuvalu is TV. 
So any TV company that wants to have TV as its internet domain pays Tuvalu money. So for example, in, in, in Ireland, we have Ulster Television, which its internet domain is u.tv. And I guarantee you, nobody in Ireland knows that we pay money to Tuvalu for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. My name is uh, Eva. I'm from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. Uh, I thought this was really interesting and I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, it was good to get such a systematic uh, overview of uh, all the different, <coughs> all the different uh, levels of recognition that you can have for these places. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I've also been very interested in these breakaway uh, republics. I went, I went uh, earlier this year to the breakaway republic of Northern Ireland. Which was <laughs> but before that, I visited uh, Abkhazia twice um, and traveled all over the, the, you know, all the way from Inguri all the way to Lake Ritsa and sort of seen, seen the entire place uh, on two occasions. And also to South Ossetia, I had the opportunity for three days to travel around all the way to Rocky Tunnel and back. Um, and I agree with you that Abkhazia has, um, you know, you can see it has a vibe of a kind of a country, you know, when you, you can see how this is, it's country-ish at least. Whereas South Ossetia, it feels uh, very different. It's, it, fe it does feel like a, a province of uh, Georgia or of, Ossetia or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I was wondering uh, whether you get any feeling now uh, as, as more uh, breakaway republics are added to the list, uh, what's the feeling in Suhumi when, when you know, suddenly they are bundled together with these sort of bandit states in Donetsk and Lugansk? Suddenly they, they are now seen, they've been working to, for some kind of recognition for so many years uh, in their own uh, peaceful way. Then, you know, I, fe I feel like the fact that they've gotten so eaten up by Russia has, uh, you know, they lost some respect there. And now suddenly they're, you know, bottom feeders with uh, the guys in Donetsk. What's the feeling in Abkhazia uh, about being put in that same group nowadays? Thanks. Well, this is a fascinating observation and question. Um, and I can't say I can answer it authoritatively simply because I haven't been in Abkhazia since uh, the, 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 the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So I can only go on what I read, contacts I have there, and just my own, based on my own analysis of having been there so many times and talked to people. And I, I would imagine there's a lot of um, uncertainty, uh, no, that's not the right word, unhappiness uh, about the very phenomenon you describe, um, this proliferation of these kind of pseudo entities, which devalues, you know, uh, for uh, I think Abkhazia is because Abkhazia is going to be put in and has been put in to the same basket. I mean, Abkhazia has, as we know, uh, it, it had a, from their perspective a war of independence. It's 30 years ago. About 4% of the Abkhazian population died. They they remember that intensely. Um, and you know, even even if we look at what's what Russia is trying to do in, in Ukraine with Donetsk and Luhansk and Kherson and Zaporizhia. I mean, even Russia's own narrative is, 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 is that it's, it's trying to protect uh, Russians who are living uh, or people who identify with Russia in Ukraine. Whereas the Abkhaz, as I've emphasized, I mean, are not Russians on the wrong side of the border. They see themselves as a, as a nation uh, and indeed have all the attributes of a nation, you know, language and history and whatnot. So, even on that level, it's, it's, it's very different. But yes, they are being put together, and, and certainly their position is far less secure now than it was a year ago. Um, I would imagine, without again having been there, that there are some who support Russia in this endeavor, and that's extremely unfortunate, and it definitely will not help their cause. Um, but I know also that there have been movements among intellectuals and, and you might say, civil society leaders in Abkhazia who have which for them is, they see it as a brave act, have tried to call on Russia to end the war, for the war to be ended, uh, which is about as far as you could probably go in Abkhazia uh, to expressing something resembling support for Ukraine. So certainly it's a divisive issue. I would imagine li Abkhazia, you know, like the Caucasus generally, is quite fractious. There's no uniformity of opinion. Um, that's why I always found looking at elections quite interesting because there's usually this pendulum between government and opposition. There's always huge protests. Civil society is very active. So, yeah, I would imagine there's, there's, there's a divided opinion on it. I'd say this is a talking point on, in kitchens around Abkhazia with, as I said, some who feel that Russia has to be supported because if Russia loses, Abkhazia's only source of protection and patronage evaporates. 
and those who, you know, can see it for what it is, a naked act of imperialism, and, you know, there's a certain type of Abkhazian who would reject that just simply for, for value reasons. So, yeah, I, 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 would, I would love to know more about this myself, and I, but you can only answer that by, by going there, and that's unlikely probably for both of us in the near future. On the final slide, uh, so uh, an aid package and a regime change, and suddenly you are left only with Russia. What, what can Abkhazia do in this situation to, to uh, stabilize the situation, uh, its international s standing, if you could say so? It can do very little, uh, bar what it's, it tries to do. It, it, it tries to establish relationships with those who are potentially open to it. That's why it's often at a below state level. So as I said, it's city state or chambers of commerce. Um, you know, but it's, its avenues are increasingly blocked because, and this is, this is a, you might say, a vicious circle. So, you know, those people who would say would wish the Abkhazians well, and that includes, of course, uh, you know, many, many in, in, in Georgia worry about um, Russification and being, you know, more or less emasculated, being, you know, uh, all, all vestiges of independence uh, and, and, and national spirit being emasculated by Russia. But, uh, you know, the attitude of many in the international community to Abkhazia has left it with almost no alternative avenues of cooperation except with Russia. So, you know, to go to university, to work and things like that. And, and that only speeds up the process of Russification and makes Abkhazians more dependent on Russia. Um, so Abkhazians are aware of this, um, and there's been you know, some written about this. There's a lot of tension uh, beneath the surface, Abkhazian resentment of Russia and Russian influence. Uh, we're seeing that coming to the fore, as I said, with the attempted purchase of this uh, resort uh, around Pitsunda. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I noticed, by the way, also the same in Northern Cyprus when I was there. I only paid one visit to Northern Cyprus. I don't profess to be an, uh, an expert in it. But I was surprised by how openly hostile might be too strong a word, certainly suspicious um, that Turkish Cypriots were about Turkey. Uh, I didn't expect it, but they were quite open about it. And certainly they, they view Turks who come from Turkey to Northern Cyprus very different from themselves, in the same way that there's no natural affection for Russians who just come to Abkhazia. There's a wonderful um, film slash documentary called um, Domino Effect, which I would recommend looking at that teases out this. It's the relationship between an Abkhazian man who ends up actually being responsible for this domino championship I mentioned. He's the deputy minister of sport, which is, a, as you can imagine, not a very important position in Abkhazia. But he marries a Russian, and uh, he finds that she's not accepted at all among his social groups. She's seen as an outsider, not one of us. And, and that's, that's there as well. So that's th the further you get away from Abkhazia, the less that seems, you know, there's always this portrayal of oh, Abkhazia, they just kind of slavishly follow Russia, they, 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 they want whatever Russia wants, but there's a huge tension there. Um, but as I said, international actors don't really give the Abkhazians many alternatives in where they can go, even in terms of travel now. I saw there that the European Union, I think they, they said they wouldn't issue visas for Abkhazians whose passports, because they can only travel with Russian passports, their Abkhazian passports don't get them anywhere. But if they were issued in Abkhazia, they wouldn't be able to travel it's questionable whether that will have a, a beneficial effect in, in de-Russifying <laughs> Abkhazia, you know, uh, because you would argue, at least I would argue, that the more interaction that the West has with the Abkhaz, the better. I mean, I think that's, that's the natural thing. If, you, if your objective is to stop the Russification of Abkhazia, if not, then that's another, uh, another matter. So what then about uh, the engagement without recognition that was discussed uh, uh, as an... EU policy some years back. Uh, is there a future for that, I or is that uh, put on hold indefinitely? Well, it seems to be put on hold, doesn't it? Um, uh, that, that was a policy which the Abkhaz always argued that there wasn't much engagement. I've, I, I, I asked this question many times of my Abkhazian interlocutors, and they were always very cynical about the quality and the quantity of European Union interactions uh, with them and that it was always heavily politicized and, and at Tbilisi's direction or approval. Um, you know, and again, this is not unique to the Abkhaz. It's a, it's a characteristic, you might say, of, of many nations and particularly so in the Caucasus. They're very proud and they don't want to be seen to be taking
taking direction from the country from their perspective that they seceded from. So when the EU say that they're doing it at George's behest, that always is a, rules things out immediately. And, and now with the, with the current war, um, Russia's war in Ukraine, I think that there's very little tolerance for any, any kind of nuance um, because you have to be nuanced to appreciate that Abkhazia is different, that it's not Donetsk, for example, or it's not just a, a, a simply a Russian uh, manufactured creation. We forget, for example, that Abkhazia existed for a decade and a half before Russia recognized it, and indeed for a decade before Russia even started to support it in some substantial way under Putin. They remember that in Abkhazia very closely, the decade when they couldn't even travel to Russia, that Russia was part of the CIS ban where men over 12 and uh, were not allowed uh, to, to visit Abkhazia. So it was mainly women and children who traded back and forth. Uh, so they remember what it's like to have no support and not to have Russian support and that that can be withdrawn. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult place. But as I said, engagement without recognition, there isn't, no one's talking about it now. Um, and that was something that was, you know, for some time the, the main policy of the EU towards these, these, these entities. And now I think it's off the table for the foreseeable future in any tangible way. More questions from the US? We can monopolize the <laughs> conversation. No? We're all satisfied? Um, let me see if I had more on my list. Um, yeah. Um, we are focused on on Abkhazia here, but could you say something about uh, also? Well, you, you went through the status of recognition or non-recognition of, of these states, but but uh, are there any dynamics that we should follow or watch out for when it comes to other de facto states? Yeah, I mean, again, as I said, we we don't consider all recognized states to be the same. We shouldn't do the same with unrecognized states. Geography matters, demography matters, uh, e the con economic resources matter. You know, South Ossetia never has the potential to be a real independent state. It's just too small and under-resourced. Abkhazia does have that potential. If it was recognized, would it survive? Well, of course it could survive if it was internationally recognized. Um, but geographically, it's in a very different place. For example, Transnistria. Transnistria is so much more engaged with the, the European Union. It has, because again, it doesn't have the same, uh, n you might say, national intransigence on issues of status. It, 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 for example, as you know, participates in the Moldovan Football League, which allows it to um, participate in the UEFA. So Sheriff, you're all aware of Sheriff, the football team. They beat Real Madrid not so long ago. So a serious football team. They're from Transnistria, an unrecognized state, because they are willing to sacrifice kind of the status aspect uh, to, to play in the Moldovan League, to participate more in international affairs. So they don't participate in this CONIF I mentioned, this Confederation of Independent Ones. Uh, and, and similarly with trade. They, they are part of Moldova's deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. So most of Transnistria's exports go westwards. Um, they get their gas virtually for free from, from, from Moscow, but they trade with Europe. And then, uh, therefore, as one person put it eloquently, they said, my, my, uh, from Transnistria, they said, my heart is with Moscow, but my legs walk towards Europe. Um, you know, so they, that's a very different place from Abkhazia, where they don't have tho those kinds of options. I mean, like their trade is almost exclusively with, with Russia. Um, they, of course, get a, a subsidy for their budget, of course, from Russia as well. Transnistria gets a subsidy, of course, via the gas, but it's, it's a different and more nuanced relationship. And that's also partly because of democracy. I mean, the Abkhaz, despite being at best, at very best, a slender majority in Abkhazia, I, d I doubt it, by the way. That's what their census says. But I think that's very much um, people speaking from the uh, from strategic interest. Some people who are of mixed background declared themselves to be Abkhazian, I think, in the last census because they thought it would enhance their status in Abkhazia because we didn't get into it because it's not my folks today talk about elections. But you do get more rights if you were an Abkhazian, ethnic Abkhazian uh, in, in, in Abkhazia, particularly if you wanted to run for president, for example, you have to be an ethnic Abkhazian and you have to be uh, a fluent speaker of the language because they're obsessed since they from their perspective they fought hard for their state for their independence they're not going to allow a non-Abkhaz to be uh, president but from a democratic perspective that seems like uh, an ethnocracy and of course that aspect is um, but if you're in Transnistria Transnistria is very different Transnistria has no ethnic majority it has Moldovans it has uh, Ukrainians which is why they're very divided on the war by the way uh, and Russians 
So it's about, and it, they divide almost evenly at about a third. Um, so they don't have this same kind of like Transnistrian aggressive nationalism or something like that, um, because they, there is no such thing in a way. There's only, a, it's much more a civic sense of state, uh, if anything, um, and that matters. And then of course, Karabakh, is a very different entity again, which is now struggling for its survival. You might have seen there was a huge uh, uh, demonstration in, in the capital, Stepanakert, uh, yesterday or the day before, an estimated, well, they, I saw the estimates of 100,000, it seems impossible to imagine, but it certainly looked like a huge, huge crowd in the capital uh, because they are worried about uh, their de facto state being assumed. Uh, and of course, that is also because of the changing, the shifting tectonic plates between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Turkey, of course, assertive Turkey being a, a major supporter of Azerbaijan, Russia's power waning in the region, all those things, you know, um, have an impact on the future of Nagorno-Karabakh. I think it's a bit like, um, how should I say, I mean, the, the lack of legitimacy in international affairs for these regions is an invitation for violence. If you look at how states um, have come and gone in history, um, usually it's because of violence. Why states die? I think it's an interesting question. Why do states die? States usually die because they are violently murdered. Um, they don't die peacefully in their beds. And, and the great, you know, um, move forward or step forward since 1945 is we've tried to create a world community where that doesn't happen that often. Uh, that states like Somalia, therefore, that's the, that, but the outcome is that states like Somalia, which are so destined to fail, are kept on, in, in, you know, life support machines because we don't allow them to die anymore. Um, but it's, it's, um, but we, what we have, though, is that we don't have any facility for divorce. Um, you know, there, we, we, we don't have that. And, and like Czechoslovakia is an isolated example where the Czechs and Slovaks, because they're, you know, very civilized about everything, simply said, we, we, we like each other, we indeed love each other, but we just love to be separate as well. And they went their own separate ways. But that's usually not how things happen. Usually it's this, you know, domestic abuse and one side wants to leave and the other side says you can't leave. And we don't have a mechanism in international relations which allows to, uh, that gives a, you might say, a, an exit route for, for a partner who's not happy with the domestic relationship in a state. And, and until that happens, we're going to end up with these kind of um, black holes, as they're sometimes called, uh, states that have left. Um, it reminds me, in fact, I know it's a digression, but in Ireland, I'm old enough again to remember in Ireland when we didn't have divorce for people. Um, you know, when I, uh, only when I was 24 years of age was divorce legalized in Ireland. Before that, no matter how unsatisfactory the relationship, you could separate, but you couldn't divorce. You could never remarry. So, um, and that's how it is with states today. You can separate, which is what Abkhazia has done. They have left the relationship, but they can never remarry. They can never have a new relationship with other states because that's the way, we, in, in the world, globally, we don't allow for divorce, unless it's by mutual consent. Uh, you know, you have to, you have to separate. And, 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 and because of that, you, you look at Azerbaijan, it's rhetoric about why it, 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 it um, was involved in these recent um, attacks. Uh, the, you know, it, it's, it argues that, well, we have a right to, it's our property, I mean, this, they have no right. So no matter what we do, we have the right, the legal right. And as so as long as you have this kind of illegitimacy to these regions, it, it is an open invitation for the states, once they get enough power or military resources, to take them back by whatever means necessary. And as we saw with Azerbaijan during that 44-day war, in which almost 10,000 people were killed, there's not a lot the international community will do. To, to step in and support uh, such entities, um, you know, and, and, uh, and that's another, you know, term. I mentioned divorce, you know, I'm old enough again to remember, God, I'm making myself sound very old, but in Ireland, in Ireland we also had the term illegitimacy for children. Um, you know, you could have an illegitimate child if your parents weren't married. There were such things and they had less rights. You know, uh, you know, a, a married couple produced a legitimate child with rights to property and things like that. A child outside of wedlock was illegitimate. We have the same with states. Uh, there are, there's a hierarchy of states, legitimate and illegitimate. Now, of course, you know, there are many who argue there's a reason for that, there's a logic to that, and it, is, it just creates a certain stability, because we can't have everybody doing what they want to do. But there were the arguments that were used about divorce in Ireland as well, you know. I mean, everybody would get married to everybody else if you, if you legalize divorce. It's much better to have no divorce. That's how it works in international relations. And, of course, those who are recognized states have a vested interest in no change because, of course, they don't want secession, um, and they support each other on these issues. So it's, it's, and it's no coincidence, for example, that the only EU states that don't recognize Kosovo, for example, despite huge consensus on the issue within the West, are those who have secessionist, potentially, issues, like Spain. You know, they think of Catalonia, so they don't recognize Kosovo. You started your presentation by saying that, that 
these uh, contested states had now uh, been in existence for uh, a couple of decades or more. But uh, I think it's, it's clear from, from uh, your presentation and what, what we've been discussing now that, that even if it's been very stable in, in, in the post-Cold War period, uh, with the Russia uh, deeply embroiled in the, in the war uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, Russia being the patron of most of these uh, states, um, uh, that has put the whole uh, situation in, in, in flux. So the frozen conflicts are potentially not that uh, frozen anymore. We, we see it uh, uh, in, in the news de facto states with, with uh, DNR and LNR being um, annexed to Russia. And, and we see it in, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, where as we speak, I suppose, uh, the president, uh, president of Azerbaijan and, and the Prime Minister of, of Armenia are, are, are meeting to, with, with Putin to discuss uh, 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 a peace agreement. So uh, what used to be very stable uh, for a long time is, is now very much in flux. And, and um, I think it's, it's important to, to, to keep an eye on this and, and, and follow this. And, if you're interested in, in this topic and, and want to learn more, uh, I would like to do some PR for the NUPI podcast, uh, where Donaka will continue the conversation about uh, uh, de facto states and, and recognition with Professor Paul Colster. Um, and that will be out in uh, a week or so, I suppose. But I think if there are no final questions from the audience, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here and thank the online audience as well and um, just say that uh, if you want to revisit um, what, what we have discussed here today there will also be uh, 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 a recording available at the uh, YouTube site of, of NUPI and the project side of NUPI's de facto project. But uh, for now, thank you very much Donika. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>